As the early morning fog slowly drifts over the cool river bottoms, the deer casually browse the fields for tasty vegetation. A 150-pound North American white-tailed deer must eat between 9 and 12 pounds of vegetation daily to remain healthy. It is midsummer. Temperatures are a cool 70 degrees at night, and in the 90s during the day. Deer usually bed down in the cooler shaded areas during the day. The deer have been grazing in the nutrient-rich hay fields most of the night. Now it is time for a corn breakfast before bedding down for a nap. Hog Wallow Farm does not allow hunting. Instead they put out a corn feeder. Thus giving the local population a varied diet, this also allows for observation of the local herd. It's breakfast time, and Eloise is headed to her favorite morning spot, the corn feeder. She hurries along, in anticipation of a wonderful corn breakfast. But alas, Gertrude and baby Isabel beat her to the feeder. Gertrude and baby Isabel are not ready to share breakfast and chase her off. She will come back later when she can have it all to herself. The white-tailed deer, Odacoileus virginianus, is a mid-sized cervid. During the summer months they appear as brown or reddish-brown, and during the fall and winter months they appear as grayish-brown. White is found on the throat regions along with around the eyes, nose, stomach, and under their tails. They get their name white-tailed deer from their bright white underside of their tail which they use as flagging in presence of danger. The lifespan of a white-tailed deer in captivity can be from 6 to 14 years. In the wild, the majority of deer do not make it to that age because of hunting, disease, and automobile collisions. The average lifespan for wild white-tailed deer is four and a half years. White-tailed deer can be found from southern Canada all the way down to South America. The home range of white-tailed deer can vary in different regions based on food and cover availability and human disturbance during different times of the year. Usually, their home range is less than one square mile throughout the majority of the year. During the breeding season, males will in most cases venture outside of their core home range in search of potential breeding opportunities. In a study done in Maryland, it was found that 63% of bucks ventured at least 0.31 miles outside of their core home range during the breeding season. They can inhabit anything from forest, plains, desert, tropical rainforests, scrublands, mountains and they even live in the city. White-tailed deer prefer to bed in areas with thick cover where they can seek cover from predators and the elements. They usually choose an area within a close proximity to a food source where they can gain the proper nutrition for growth.
Females usually stay in a specific area close to food sources for their fawns, while males tend to seek the thickest cover. The area's white-tailed deer use for habitat may also shift with the seasons and the rut. The season of the year is likely to change the face of the area the deer inhabit, and food and water may be located in different areas throughout the year thus moving the deer. The rut or white-tailed deer breeding season also tends to displace them as they seek and chase potential mates. Every winter a buck sheds, or casts, their antlers. As soon as their antlers are shed they start growing them again. A thick tissue called velvet encases the antler during the growth period. As the growing period goes on, which lasts throughout the summer months, the antler begins to calcify and harden. Once hard the velvet dries and is rubbed off by the buck. The antler cycle of a buck directly corresponds with their hormone level. When antlers are shed the buck's hormone levels are at an extreme low. As the growing period goes on the buck's hormone levels gradually increase. The period that directly follows the shedding of the velvet is when the buck has his highest hormone levels. Let's get back to Hogwallow Farm and join the herd. A doe that is pregnant for the first time will usually have one fawn. But it is common for does to have twins after their first year of fawning, if adequate nutrition is available. It is mid-July. A blessed event has taken place with the birth of a new fawn. This fawn is just a few hours old and very unsteady on her feet. She is one of two fawns born the night before. The other was in the woods with their mother. Driving up the road, and here's a newborn. And the mother started, someone started really yelling loud. Now they doze, doze up in the hill, making a lot of noise. So I'm getting out of here. This thing is, is as big as uh, a baby dog. All right. Go with your mama. It is early morning at Hogwallow. The hay fields are drenched in fog as Matilda and her babies, Willoughby, and Poppy, playfully scamper along. The fawns are growing bigger by the day. They are slowly loosing their spots and it won't be long before Mom stops letting them nurse. They are headed over to the corn feeder, as they do most days. Also in the area are Gertrude, her daughter, Isabel, and surprisingly, Eloise. The original adversaries have become friends, and are hanging around together, as does often do. Later in the day as Gertrude and her daughter, Isabel, approach the feeder, Gertrude is nervous. Being ever wary of her surroundings, she pauses, then slowly proceeds. Notice her tail going up as she warns Isabel, and any other deer behind her, that there might be danger. Gertrude's senses were right. There was quite a commotion going on up at the feeder. Grace, 
and her fawns, Dolly and Bo, decided to have a snack at the corn feeder. As the trio approached the feeder, they found a marauding young buck making himself at home. This called for some swift action as the dynamic trio boldly chased him away. Luckily for the dynamic trio, the young buck decides to quickly leave rather than fight with such a vicious adversary. Proud of themselves they bask in triumph before heading back to the feeder. Wisely, Gertrude and Isabel decided to come back later after all the commotion was over. Hogwallow Farm puts out a salt lick for its deer. Salt is hard to find in nature and a salt lick with minerals is beneficial to the growth and well-being of deer. Here we see the lick by the feeder being enjoyed. Often, hunters will put special salt lick blocks out that contain minerals and supposedly help the bucks grow bigger and stronger antlers. Hogwallow Farm has a small herd of goats. They are a Kiko and boar mixture, basically a meat goat. They are rescues from the slaughterhouse and a welcome, wonderful, addition to the farm. Eloise would come up to her side of the fence every night and look at the goats. The goats were concerned about this stranger and gathered together as they do when worried. The goats had seen deer before but never had one come this close. They were concerned. Eventually they realized that she was not a threat and were not scared when she entered their pasture to eat with them. The grass in the pasture is the same everywhere. Eloise just wanted some occasional company. She still dines with the goats from time to time. <coughs> Farmer Bill has an adjoining farm to Hog Wallow. The deer roam freely between both farms. Once in a while, Elsie, the cow, sneaks over to Bill's farm for a snack. Here he is trying to chase her home. She will sneak back when he is gone. The deer and cows frequently co-mingle. It is late September, leaves are starting to change and days are getting a little cooler. It is also the time that the rut is starting. This will continue for several months. For several days now, Matilda has been seen hanging around with a fine, handsome, young buck named Charlie. Charlie has been accepted by Willoughby and Poppy. After the rut, 
Charlie will most likely go back to his old ways and just hang around the thicket with the boys. Matilda, Willoughby and Poppy will be alone again. Meanwhile, at the south end of the farm, first-time mom Georgia brings her daughter Dorothy out of the woods for the first time. Dorothy is young and small. Most fawns are much larger this late in September. Together they will warily enjoy a pasture meal of grass and hay. A case of mistaken identity. Little Dorothy was looking for a meal from Georgia, her mom. Unfortunately, from behind, Eloise looked like mom. You can see the surprise on Eloise's face as Dorothy approaches. One sniff and she knew it wasn't mom. Both are surprised as Dorothy scampers away in search of her real mom. Gertrude, Isabel and Eloise are now inseparable friends. Here they are slowly wandering to the corn feeder. Notice how much darker Eloise is than the other two. It is a beautiful morning and the trio is wandering to the feeder for a snack. Eloise has been acting goofy all morning and lagging behind. Here Isabel, who is starving, patiently waits for her to catch up. Then along bounces Eloise and off they go. Lolly and Bo are growing up. It is early October. They have lost their spots and mom refuses to nurse them anymore. They are headed up to the Liberty Field to meet with their cousins, Poppy and Willoughby, before getting a corn snack. Matilda is on one side of the fence and the fawns on the other. This is not by accident. Mom dear need a little time off too. Eventually she gives in, jumps the fence, and reunites with the children at the feeder. Dear sexually mature at six months of age. As you watch the kids romp and play, the sexual maturation becomes obvious.
The fence is 5 feet tall. It is a nice cool fall morning. Georgia and Dorothy are wandering around the south part of the farm. Georgia signals to Dorothy that it is breakfast time and the rush is on. Dorothy has learned to make sure she has the right mom when it is feeding time. Matilda, Willoughby, and Poppy are walking towards the feeder. Both fawns are maturing beautifully, and are becoming darker for the winter. The time for free meals is over as Matilda puts her hoof down and tells the fawns no more nursing. Problems caused by deer The following is an interview with Robbie Buffington, owner of Buffington Farms, an expansive corn, cattle, hay and poultry farm in Gillsville, Georgia. Robbie explains the problems caused by deer to his corn crop. Hello, my name is Robbie Buffington. I live in Gillsville, Georgia. We do about 150 acres to 200 acres of corn a year. Um, the deer seem to be the, our biggest problem right now. Between you know 150 to 200 acres of corn, they probably eat probably 10 acres of corn. They'll go around the uh, outside rows and destroy you know the corn on the outside rows uh, when you're not doing but you know 150 to 200 acres 10 acres is, is, is a lot of corn you know that's a couple thousand dollars and and profits that that we're losing uh, you can get a uh, permit to uh, shoot the deer but then it just takes your time and, and money you know to go out there and and, and shoot them and we have neighbors around here, uh, Bob Barnett, he, he likes looking at the deer. Um, he likes really filming the deer. So we try not to uh, shoot all the deer that, that we can unless we're gonna, we're gonna eat them and there's just too many in our cornfields to, uh, to do that with. So we, we save them for him to take pictures of. After viewing Bob Barnett's documentary several times, Robbie said he was so touched by it that he was never going to shoot another deer. In fact he said he was turning vegan, and was joining the D.L.M. movement. Another problem with deer is that they are capable of living in a suburban environment. Here we see a large buck making himself at home in a fashionable neighborhood. He is very relaxed and obviously comfortable with his surroundings. Although beautiful and majestic to look at, they will decimate your shrubs and flower beds in a short period of time. Approximately one and a half million deer vehicle accidents happen each year in the United States. These cause about 150 deaths and $1.1 billion in property damage. This young female fawn was run over by a very careless driver at Hog Wallow. Extreme caution must be exercised when living in a rural environment, especially during the rut. White-tailed deer have good eyesight and acute hearing, but depend mainly on their sense of smell to detect danger and their ability to run and bound quickly through dense vegetation to escape danger. White-tailed deer are preyed on by large predators such as humans, wolves, mountain lions, bears, jaguars, and coyotes. Coyotes look like dogs. They are not. They are invasive. Coyotes will eat your pet cat, your pet dog, or even you if given the opportunity. Coyotes kill the indigenous animal populations. Turkeys, deer, 
rabbits, or anything they can catch. Here we see two large coyotes in the area of our deer and their fawns, they are hunting for something to eat. Many newborn fawns fall prey to these invasive predators. Hogwallow tries to keep the population under control by employing specialized hunters, who use equipment designed for the job. Here they are going out on a night hunt. Unfortunately, they were outsmarted this night. However, it is a constant battle to keep our deer, turkeys, and other native animals on the farm safe. The farm has a plethora of wildlife living on it. These two hen turkeys are doing their annual happiness dance. They do this every November. They are happy that they are not in someone's oven. Here is Mama Bobcat out for a leisurely afternoon walk. It is rare to see bobcats in the daytime. Here we are at night time. Mama Bobcat is walking with her kids. However they have a plan up their paws. Mama Bobcat's kids, called kittens, plan an ambush for her. Kittens will be kids. You never know what creatures the game camera will capture. Here we see Farmer Bill headed home after chasing Elsie the cow off his property. Of course, this is Woody, enjoying an acorn. And who else but Daffy, the wood duck? Strangely, wood ducks don't quack, they sort of peep. These are mallards, and they do quack. Mama Raccoon taking her kids, Mo, Larry, and Curly for an evening walk. Curly better keep up. Bucks, in particular, seem to take a keen interest in our cameras.
This young buck is doing a wonderful job of cleaning the lens. He wound up turning the camera completely around and left it with a very foggy lens. This is the same camera that got a deer washing, now, Mama Bobcat's kittens have decided to attack it. The attack is brutal. One of the kittens out looking for trouble. This particular camera sure attracts a lot of attention. This doe is fascinated by it. Look at the heron keeping an eye on the raccoon. It is a nice night for a swim. It is mid-November. The leaves have changed color and are departing their trees. The rut is in full bloom and love is in the air. The breeding season for white-tailed deer is during the fall and winter. In the most northern portion of the white-tailed deer's range, breeding may begin at the end of August, and the most southern deer may breed into January. Most of the breeding occurs in November. The gestation period for white-tailed deer is between 190 and 210 days. Here we see Romeo the buck with one thing on his mind. Matilda's maternal instinct causes her to carefully watch as Romeo chases after her daughter, Poppy. As it turns out, Willoughby and Poppy went over and under a non-electrified fence that only they knew was there. This stopped Romeo in his tracks not knowing if the fence was electrified or not. Poppy got away this time. Or Matilda just watched the whole thing hoping her Romeo would come by some day. With hormones at very high levels bucks get into fights quite regularly. Romeo is slowly circling Rufus as the two bucks size each other up. This is a very tense situation for both. Rufus now circles behind Romeo. Romeo is at a bad angle when Rufus charges, gets twisted around and is slightly injured. He is limping as he walks away. Bucks often injure one another during the rut. Sometimes the fights result in severe injury or death. The fight has been slowed down here to get a better look.
Romeo was seen later and the next day with a noticeable limp. There is nothing humorous about a buck fight, however, watch Peter Possum, casually enjoying a meal under the feeder, rapidly books it out of there when the fight starts. Several days later. Some good news for Romeo fans. Although walking slowly, and with a slight limp, he was mobile and otherwise looked okay. The next day, Romeo was videoed, in a hay field with a doe. He still has a limp, and was licking his right rear leg as many animals do when hurt. The good news is that he seems to be better. Charlie Alzheimer, from upstate New York, has studied white-tailed deer for many years and is an expert on the subject. He says that, one of the greatest ways white-tails communicate with each other is through the scent they leave behind. Throughout the year bucks are constantly marking their territory with scent, and scraping behavior is one of the chief ways they do it. Though bucks will work a scrapes overhanging licking branch throughout the year, their most aggressive scraping is done from October to December, when testosterone levels are highest. When a white-tailed buck makes a scrape he does so where there is an attractive branch hanging along a roadway, at the edge of a field, on a well-worn trail, or in a random area he's walking through. In most cases a buck begins the scraping process by rubbing his forehead, preorbital, and nasal glands on the branch, and in some cases will actually lick and chew on the overhanging branch. Once done, most bucks will pour the leaves and other debris from the ground under the branch, then urinate into the poured out earth. The process usually takes less than two minutes, but during this time a buck will leave liberal amounts of scent behind. Scraping, like rubbing, allows a buck to make his presence known by dispensing scent throughout his area. This fellow really puts his heart into it. Charlie furthermore states that he does not believe does utilize scrapes. Well, he doesn't know our Georgia deer as you see here. Here is Gertrude, and she has a definite interest in the scrape. This is two-timing Charlie at the communal scrape. Deer, unlike hawks, geese, and some humans, are not monogamous. He is once again a swinging single. After watching the last fellow at the scrape, Charlie looks like he has low T. And finally, this is Romeo approaching the scrape several days after his altercation. He still limps, but appears to be doing better.
Now, ever see or hear a deer sneeze? Just had to throw that in. We will revisit the herd one last time. Dot as the circle of life continues, we will visit each of our friends and families to say goodbye for now and to wish them well. Life in the wild is dangerous and unpredictable. We will continue to follow our herd and wildlife throughout the winter and into the spring as their lives unfold. Our favorite buck, Romeo, still limps as he takes care of business at a scrape. Matilda looks poised and beautiful in the morning air. She is getting her dream wish, as Romeo is hot on her trail. Willoughby is looking good as he struts by in the procession. Love conquers all as Romeo tries to overcome his infirmities. And finally comes Poppy, like a rocket. Charlie is still enjoying the single's life, as he visit the herd's favorite scrape. In the early morning mist, Matilda has learned from the squirrels how to get corn out of the feeder when she wants more than was put out. Grace, and her fawns, Dolly and Bo, are all doing well. Bo is starting to grow horns and looking very handsome. Nothing like a nice warm milk breakfast for little Dorothy. Being a late born she will continue nursing for a while. As you can see, Georgia has learned to not get knocked over by Dorothy's aggressive feeding. All that pent-up energy. Little Dorothy hilariously dances around. Must be the good breakfast she had this morning.
As Gertrude and baby Isabel stroll by the pond, they are pursued by a young buck. Obviously they did not like his advances. And finally, that is Eloise in the top of the frame. She, along with the other mom does, are trying to keep the children under control. Hopefully, Eloise will have her own fawns next spring. It is early February, and a rare occurrence has happened at Hogwallow Farm. It snowed. Our herd has never seen snow before. Enjoy the next few moments as you watch the deer look in wonderment at the totally alien environment. Four hours later, 
snow doesn't last very long in Georgia. Welcome back to Hog Wallow Farm. It is midwinter, and a lot has been going on with our white tailed deer herd and our wildlife. We will revisit the deer families as well as the wildlife that live on the farm to see how they are doing. And introduce you to some new members of our wildlife family. So let's get going. Georgia's climate is considered subtropical. However, there are four seasons. And it does snow occasionally. The deer change color with the seasons. They are dark and brown in the winter and blend into their environment quite well. Let's catch up on our deer families and bucks that we have been following. This has to be brought to everyone's attention after seeing the horns growing on little Poppy's head. It has been determined that Poppy is a he. Matilda has two sons. And as seen in our videos, they are a tight-knit, loving, family. However, we will continue calling him Poppy. Matilda, Willoughby, and Poppy live in the woods near the feeder. It has been observed that although the does and their fawns spend time together, the families tend to spend a good portion of their time in different sections of the farm. Grace and her fawns Bo and Dolly are doing well and were acclimating to the new environment. Here we see the deer that hang around the southeast part of the farm. On the left is Matilda and her sons. On the right is Georgia and her daughter Dorothy. Dorothy is still a little small as she was a late born. However, she is growing nicely. Everyone seems to be in good health and the fawns are growing. Georgia and Dorothy walk by the pond on a winter afternoon. A lot of people have been asking about Romeo, the injured buck. Well, he made it through hunting season and was spotted mid-February near the pond with Grace and her fawns Bo and Dolly. He is walking much better and his injury seems almost healed. We catch up with Romeo as he walks by the communal scrape on a cold, wet, February night. Notice that he has no interest in the licking branch or the ground scrape. This is a good indication that the rut, or mating season, is over. 
Another good indication that the rut is over is the congregating of bucks. They are now hanging around together rather than chasing does. They will stay together in the men's club till next rut. Here are the boys out for a morning stroll. It will not be long before they start shedding their antlers. This large buck has already lost the left side of his antlers. And yes, that is Romeo following up the group with a slight limp. Not to be outdone, the girls have a club of their own. Here we see 10 of them gathered together. Sometimes, doe herds can reach 100 in number. Georgia and Dorothy curiously watch as Eloise gets her morning exercise before snacking on some nice weeds. This is Rufus. He is the buck that had an altercation and injured Romeo. However, he and Romeo have been seen hanging around together. Now that the rut is over, they are letting bygones be bygones. Deer, like many other animals show affection. Matilda gives Poppy a good face licking on this cold February night. This is thought to be an expression of affection between deer. We caught up with Romeo again the last day of February. The first deer is Alfonso, who had the largest set of horns this year. Following him is Romeo who, unfortunately, is still limping. We see Matilda and her sons near the corn feeder in late February. She always shows affection for her boys. Once the bucks drop their horns it will be very difficult for us to differentiate them. The last buck you may recognize as two-timing Charlie or just plain old Charlie. He is maturing nicely. Charlie has been leading a charmed singles life since leaving Matilda, Willoughby, and Poppy. However, rumor has it that he is behind on alimony and fawn support payments. The baby raccoons have grown a lot in the past several months. 
Mo, Barry, and Curly have discovered Matilda's favorite snacking spot, the corn feeder. As you can see, Mo, Larry, and Curly do not exactly get along when it comes to sharing corn. Concrete blocks were placed next to the feeder to make it easier to fill. And the raccoons have learned to dig for corn in the holes. Watch as the resourceful raccoons attempt to steal as much corn as they can. Alfonso the buck was stopping by for a midnight snack, but decided that messing with three unscrupulous raccoons was not worth the effort. Willoughby and Poppy decided to head up to the feeder for a late night snack. But alas, the raccoons were there. Not having seen the raccoons at their feeder before, the boys didn't know what to do. Eventually they ran off to get mom. Surely she would know how to handle these marauding raccoons. Matilda definitely had a plan. She and the boys surrounded the thieves. Now raccoons are pretty tough customers. They know how to fight since they fight with each other all the time. However, Matilda knew that her secret weapon was Poppy. She knew that Poppy was a scrapper and would do his best to beat up the thieving raccoons. Now Poppy did not have very big horns yet. In fact they were just little knots on his head. But he didn't let this deter him from acting as though they were huge. He bucked and stomped. He kept his voracious attacks up for an hour as the raccoons kept sneaking back. With a little help from mom, Poppy did an admirable job and showed the thieving raccoons who the boss was. Notice Poppy loosening his neck muscles like Mike Tyson used to do before a fight. Watch as Poppy zones in on a raccoon as a cat would when stalking a mouse. Poppy's actions that night at the feeder made him a legend amongst the local herds.
Well, Mama Raccoon finally got hold of her babies. She made them go home after the embarrassing episode up at the feeder. Every night the raccoon clan goes down to the pond to search for food. Here we see Mama and Daddy Raccoon, Mo, Larry, Curly, and Uncle Matt pulling up the rear. It is a cold winter night as Uncle Matt, always the adept fisherman, catches dinner. However, Bernie the Heron, is trying to catch dinner too. As usual, the raccoons manage to disrupt his fishing. All of Bernie's squawks don't seem to deter Matt the raccoon from his fishing. We will have more on Bernie later on. There is one visitor to the pond that nobody messes with. Here is Sally the skunk getting a drink. Now that all the disruption that can be disrupted is finished, and their bellies are full, the clan packs up and goes home. Now this is Bernie. He is our resident heron at the How Wallow Pond. He may look like someone famous but he is not him. Those are not the brown mittens on Bernie that have become famous lately. Bernie is a blue heron and quite a character. Whenever he sees a camera, and we have lots around, he will do something funny, stare at it or poop in front of everyone. Bernie fancies himself a flamingo dancer, but, unfortunately for Bernie he is not pink. He does try hard though and does have some cool moves. Bernie makes his living by fishing. He fishes day and night and is the consummate fish catcher. He is keen of eye and extremely stealthy when fishing. Bernie spends most of his time at the north or the south part of the pond where it is shallow and he can wade in. Unfortunately for Bernie though, this is where the raccoons and bobcats fish. Often this creates a clash of species and Bernie usually does not win. When Bernie flies it is a sight to behold. With a wingspan of up to six feet, he magnificently and gracefully glides through the air. Wrap it up, Bernie. This is Bernie's voice. Songbird he is not.
The worst conflicts that Bernie had was with the kitten bobcats. They were on him like a chicken on a June bug for several days and nights. Bernie had to keep a close watch on them as they were constantly sneaking around the shoreline. Notice the kitten on the left. They continually tried her best to attack and eat Bernie. Then it happened. An attempt on Bernie's life. We will see the attack from two cameras. Bernie takes off and heads to the south part of the pond, squawking all the way. The kitten then heads in Bernie's direction. However, the kitten had enough for one night. This view is from a second close by camera. And this is a slow motion view of the dastardly attack. You can hear Bernie's squawking, which went on for quite a while. There was a good lesson in the attack for Bernie. Never, never take your eye off the kittens. After the attack, Bernie keeps a close eye out for anything that might try to eat him, especially the kittens. The night after the attack, Bernie was especially jumpy. Robbie the muskrat was swimming across the pond and surfaced next to Bernie. Both were surprised. Bernie looked a little shell-shocked as Robbie continued on his swim. It never seems to end for poor Bernie. Otto. The resident otter happened to swim past Bernie and both were surprised. However, Otto and Bernie usually tolerate each other. And who else but Matt the raccoon would make Bernie's life troublesome? Here is one instance when Bernie came out on top. A black-headed vulture was just trying to get a drink of water. However, after losing many battles lately, Bernie wanted to show dominance over someone. Even if it was a friendly vulture. So Bernie did his version of the Karate Kid's famous crane move. It worked. Just the sight of this move put fear in the heart of the vulture and he took off and Bernie started getting his self-confidence back. We will leave Bernie now and wish him well as we check on the other wildlife at Hog Wallow Farm. Every winter swarms of blackbirds are seen at the farm. Hundreds of birds flying and feeding together. They will fly, land and feed then take off to the next spot. Blackbird flocks seen in Georgia and elsewhere during fall and winter are likely mixed flocks that contain starlings as well as other blackbird-related species. Red-winged blackbirds, rusty blackbirds, common grackles and brown-headed cowbirds. A couple of reasons have been given for flocking in winter. 
One is that flocks offer better protection from predators. Also, thousands of pairs of eyes may be more effective than one pair in finding food. And just like that, they take off and move on. In a month or so the flock will disband as nesting and breeding begins. There is one raccoon living on the farm that is special. His name is Tripod. He is a three-legged fellow and nobody seems to know how he lost one of his rear legs. Some say he was born this way, others say it was a coyote attack, and yet others say it was the large snapping turtle that lives in the pond. Regardless of his handicap, Tripod seems to be doing okay. He doesn't hang around with the other raccoons, and is more of a loner. Other than his handicap, he appears to be in good health and gets around surprisingly well. We wish him the best and will continue following him throughout the months. Imagine, if you will, that you are walking through the woods at night. A dark, dark winter's night. Suddenly you hear an awful noise, a noise like you have never heard before. Is it human, or animal? You are about to enter the nighttime zone at Ho Wallow Farm.
Late morning and a coyote is wandering around the south part of the farm. Listen to the coyotes hunting something down as they upset and scatter the deer. A leisurely stretch. This coyote has food. What did he kill? This coyote shows caution at the pond. Watch as Pedro the possum keeps a very close eye on the coyote down in the field. Remember, it is completely dark out and these animals can see. If you viewed the first white-tailed deer video, you understand what a problem coyotes are to the indigenous wildlife population. Hogwallow Farm lets specialized hunters hunt coyote if the population becomes too large. Today's high-tech hunter uses very specialized gear as listed next. Electric bike, $1,500. Rifle, $1,000. Thermal rifle scope, $3,200. Tripod and accessories, $200. Flashlight and clothing, $200. Suppressor, $900, and finally, Coyote Caller, $200, plus ammunition. Running around the woods on a cold, dark, winter's night with your buddy and a lot of expensive gear your wife didn't know you bought. Priceless. The good news is the wives will probably never see this video. Right after the hunters left the spot they were hunting in this night, the coyotes ran by. Now, we at Hog Wallow have a suggestion, the weather is starting to warm. Our hunters might do better if they hunt as their ancestral hunter forefathers did. Loin cloths and spears. The cost would be nominal. Final score this winter, coyotes batting 1000. Hunters, zero. We at Hog Wallow appreciate the effort put in by our hunters. Coyote are extremely smart and guile. They are not easy to hunt and deadly to our wildlife. However, might be fun to see our hunters running around in loin cloths and chucking spears. Just as the deer, bobcats and coyotes leave messages for each other. We know for a fact that this message said, Hey Felix, your old pal Wiley just saying hi. Hunter's gone. Party time. It is an early winter morning when a group of deer decide to go explore the pond. Both young buck and some does. Most have not been to the pond yet. 
Let's watch as they explore and learn about this new environment. Everybody knows that beavers are the engineers and builders of the animal world. Hogwallo Farm has lots of beavers. Most of them live where they can peacefully build their dams without damaging our fields. This beaver, however, built her dam where the water backed up into our hay fields. Unfortunately for her, we had to lower part of her dam to drain the fields. Don't worry though, she had another dam already in progress further downstream and is already rebuilding the one we lowered. Getting videos of working beavers is extremely hard. They almost always work at night. One wonders how in the world they know where to place the sticks they bring in. The dams are incredibly strong. Ask anyone who has tried to manually remove one. Mama Beaver's son follows her over the dam. His name is Bucky. 
He is in engineering school at present. We believe he is enrolled at Georgia Tech. Bucky's grandfather used to star in commercials for Ipana toothpaste. Bucky Beaver's Space Guard! It seems everyone uses the dam as a bridge. A kitten crosses both ways. Pedro the possum crosses. As does our old friend Tripod the raccoon. This is a picture of the dam iron the daytime before it was lowered. The dam was a little over four feet tall from the bottom of the stream to its top. Quite a project for one beaver. Let's catch up on what is happening around the farm before we say goodbye. One of the kittens is out making a lot of noise. This is startling our young deer. Dan Schmidt wrote in the article Whitetail Wisdom, when a white-tailed deer becomes alert, it often stops abruptly and begins stamping. It almost seems like an exaggerated gesture. The deer curls its front leg up and into its body and then slams that hoof to the ground in a forceful manner. The deer will typically stand in the same spot and repeat this gesture until it identifies what it initially perceives to be an unknown source of danger. The source of danger in this case was one of our kittens out looking for trouble again. A few of the neighbor's cows escaped from their farm and have been wandering around Hog Wallow for several weeks. They are very hard to catch. Several attempts to do so have failed so far. The cows have made themselves at home. Thus far they have knocked over three cameras and slobbered on several more. Hopefully we can can corral them soon. Normally deer and cows get along. This calf thinks differently, chasing one of our deer. As we have observed, all species will have problems raising their young from time to time. To us this calf seems a little large to still be feeding off her mother. We have named her Millennial, Millie. Hogwallow has about 35 cameras scattered about the farm. Lately, the renegade cows have been attacking them. The cows can fog up, slime, and knock over a camera in a heartbeat. This attack was merciless. Luckily, the camera was not broken. It was just slimed and dirty. Cows are not the only ones who messed with our cameras this month. A couple of young does decided to play in front of the camera that we have set up in the water at the edge of the pond. Eventually one of the girls decided to turn it around. A deer selfie. We have stopped frames so that you might see the action, which significantly slowed down.
notice the eye contact that the deer has with the camera. Not only the camera, but the lens on the camera. She looks directly into it. Not once but numerous times as if performing for us. Note that she jumps sideways as if to show off. She then turns the camera around very smoothly. You would think a camera would look the same from any direction to a deer. Maybe not. Is it possible she wanted it facing forward? Who knows, but we definitely look forward to more performances from these talented girls. We made it through winter. It is officially spring. A lot happened over the winter months on the farm. The fawns are growing up and many have left their mothers and now hang around with the bucks or the does in ever-growing herds. Poppy and Willoughby are still with their mother for now and Poppy has become quite the celebrity since his fight with the raccoons at the feeder. The kittens are growing and always getting into some kind of mischief, it seems. Mama Bobcat is looking a little plump in the middle. Who knows? Tripod is hobbling around and thus far doing well. He still does not hang with the clan. Romeo still limps and we are not sure if he will ever get better after his fight. Some days he limps less than others, so there is hope. Eloise is acting crazy as usual and still very active. And the coyotes are still here as our poor hapless hunters try to outsmart them. Loin cloths and spears are looking better all the time. As the horns on the bucks depart their heads it will be impossible to tell them apart. We will do our best. Although, and unfortunately, we will be able to spot Romeo. Otto the otter still hangs around the pond fishing all the time. So we say goodbye for now to all our friends as we go into spring. We will be monitoring them and hopefully all will do well. Goodbye and thank you for watching. It is springtime at Hog Wallow Farm. Young are being born and family started. As the flora begins to blossom, leaves emerge from their branches, flowers bloom and pollen wafts through the air like a fog at times. Everyone is sneezing. Snapping turtles are coming out of hibernation. Mom turkeys are cautiously walking their young chicks. Bird 
Bernie's cousin looks for a meal at a beaver dam. Young bucks are growing horns. And the deer are all starting to turn red as they do every spring. Geese are pairing up. The bobcat kittens are grown up. There is a new addition to the farm, more on him later. Mama Beaver is busier than ever with new springtime dams. Unfortunately the coyote are still here and in increasing numbers. Mo, Larry and Curly still raid the feeder. Newborn fawns are showing up. In the early morning, the hay is so high you cannot see the deer. This means it is haying season at the farm. The next few weeks will be filled with mowing, drying, and baling the hay crop. Welcome to the white-tailed deer and wildlife at Hog Wallow Farm Part 3. We will continue with the wild cow saga and bring it to a conclusion. Here is a recap to bring us up to date. A few of the neighbors' cows escaped from their farm and have been wandering around Hog Wallow for several weeks. They are very hard to catch. Several attempts to do so have failed so far. The cows have made themselves at home. Thus far they have knocked over three cameras and slobbered on several more. Hopefully we can, can corral them soon. Normally deer and cows get along. This calf thinks differently, chasing one of our deer. The cows can fog up, slime, and knock over a camera in a heartbeat. And now, for the rest of the story. The cows continue to wander the farm and have made themselves very much at home. They cannot pass up a camera without knocking it over or slobbering on it. They have wandered into our hay storage barns and eaten their fill. Plus they have knocked over a lot of new grown hay in the fields. However, not all the fields are fenced in and there have been reports of cows crossing and wandering the nearby roads. This is extremely dangerous. In one attack on the cameras they completely turned it upside down. We took the ATV out every day to try to track them down. However, they were extremely wary and would run for the woods or the swamp whenever they heard or saw us coming. Most of their wanderings seemed to be at night. They were fast, agile, and impossible to corner in the woods. Then one night one of the cows wandered onto a nearby road and was hit by a car killing the cow and causing damage to the car. Luckily, the driver only sustained minor injuries. Every year, approximately 20 people in the US are killed by these seemingly docile creatures. Most of the victims were farm workers who were trampled or gored. A few of these cows weighed over 1,000 pounds and were becoming dangerous and somewhat aggressive to our ATV. By comparison, an average of five people are killed each year by sharks. After the car accident, 
the farmer who owned the cows decided to take more aggressive action. He put out sweet feed in a field for several days to get the cows to eat there. He then put up a pen with an open gate and continued to put sweet feed in it. Eventually the cows got used to the pen and feed. The farmer camped out in the brush and as the cows fed he ran over and slammed the gate. Three of the cows were captured this day. One was killed by a car. We do not know the fate of the other two and are looking into it. Since the farmer took down his pen we are pretty sure they were captured or killed. Now there is a propensity to feel sorry for the cows. That is somewhat natural. However, farmers will tell you that there are some cows that should not be kept with the herd and need to be gotten rid of. The farmer's inability to capture them early on caused an accident which could have taken a life. The end fate of all beef cattle is that they will be slaughtered. Despite what some of the younger generation think, meat does not grow in the supermarket. The farmer wanted everyone to know that the cows can be visited in two weeks at the local meat counter at the Publix in Gainesville, Georgia. That is the fate of beef cattle. These guys got the luxury of running wild, as the wind, for several months. Now, back to our wildlife. Stop everything, now that everybody is bummed out about the cows and having to go to Publix to see them we have some great news. Our cameras showed that the one last mama cow was still on the farm. This is the one the farmer could not find. We called him and he luckily managed to catch her. A week later he called and stated that instead of sending this wild bunch to Publix, he reunited them with his herd and they settled down nicely. So, after several months of running wild, they are back home. Let's hope they stay there. But wait! Another cow escape occurred. This time a neighboring farm's cows escaped and made themselves at home in the lush hay fields of Hog Wallow. Now these belong to farmer Phil and some of them were bottle fed and hand raised. They were very friendly and congenial, unlike the other renegade herd. Even Ferdinand the bull was of exemplary character. Farmer Phil was an outstanding farmer who knew his stuff. First thing he did was scout out the herd. Then he devised a plan to lure the cows back home. He took buckets of sweet food, which is a mixture of grain and molasses, out to the cows for several days. Sweet feed is like cow crack. Then he took bucket loads out in his tractor and the sweet feed crackhead cows went crazy for it, and followed him home. That is Ferdinand the bull and his son Freddy the calf pulling up the rear of the herd. Farmer Phil put the F in farming. Job well done. This is the story of Fred the donkey. We got a call from one of our farmer neighbors saying that we had a donkey running around with the wild cows. We checked our cameras and sure enough, nobody claimed him or wanted him and he was in rough shape. He had probably not been properly tended to for years. Since the cows would eventually be captured, we decided to corral the donkey. He is short but very strong. Donkeys in the area are not sought after animals except to keep as pets or use as guard donkeys for cattle or goats. The donkey or ass, 
Equus africanus asinus, is a domesticated member of the horse family, Equidae. The wild ancestor of the donkey is the African wild ass, E. africanus. The donkey has been used as a working animal for at least 5,000 years. There are more than 40 million donkeys in the world, mostly in underdeveloped countries, where they are used principally as draft or pack animals. A male donkey or ass is called a jack, a female jenny or jennet. Asses were first domesticated around 3000 BC, probably in Egypt or Mesopotamia, and have spread around the world. As beasts of burden and companions, asses and donkeys have worked together with humans for millennia. Fred may be small but he is tough. We see him here getting his share of a feed block. The cows backed up as Fred backed in. Donkeys like company so Fred, as we found out was supposedly his name, like to hand with the renegade cows. They didn't particularly like him or want him around, but he followed them anyway. Fred continued to wander the farm for weeks until one day we were able to capture him. That is Jordan, the feeder and camera tender, struggling to bring him in. We got Fred into a pen safely. He had a visit from a vet, probably his first ever, received the necessary shots and treatment, and had a visit from the farrier. The farrier will have to visit a few more times to get his hooves back in shape. Right now Fred is kept separated from the goats. In time we hope they can be united. The vet figured that Fred was about 7 to 8 years old. Working donkeys in the poorest countries have a life expectancy of 12 to 15 years. In more prosperous countries, they may have a lifespan of 30 to 50 years. Seems Fred will be around for a while. A relative new animal to our area is the nine-banded armadillo. Armadillos are small to medium-sized mammals. They are characterized by a leathery armor shell and long, sharp claws for digging. They have short legs, but can move quite quickly. The average length of an armadillo is about 30 inches, including tail. They are prolific diggers. They use their sharp claws to dig for food, such as grubs, and to dig dens. The nine-banded armadillo prefers to build burrows in moist soil near the creeks, streams, around which it lives and feeds. The diets of different armadillo species vary, but consist mainly of insects, grubs, and other invertebrates. Armadillos have very poor eyesight, and use their keen sense of smell to hunt for food. They dig their burrows with their claws, making only a single corridor the width of the animal's body. We have named this fellow Aloysius the armadillo. As you can see he is a hearty digger. About a month ago he started digging a burrow right next to a road on the farm. Strangely he shows up every night and day, digs a little and then goes away. We have no idea why he does this or where he goes. However, the burrow is consistently getting deeper. Armadillos are often used in the study of leprosy, they are particularly susceptible due to their unusually low body temperature, which is hospitable to the leprosy bacterium. Humans can acquire a leprosy infection from armadillos by handling them or consuming armadillo meat. Armadillos are a presumed vector and natural reservoir for the disease in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. The armadillo is also a natural reservoir for Chagas disease. So, the lesson here is look, but don't touch. This is one of our resident muskrats. His name is Marvin. Adult muskrats weigh 1.3 to 4.4 pounds, with a body length of 8 to 10 inches. They are covered with short, thick fur of medium to dark brown color. Their long tails, covered with scales rather than hair, 
are their main means of propulsion. Muskrats spend most of their time in the water and can swim underwater for 12 to 17 minutes. They live in families, consisting of a male and female pair and their young. To protect themselves from the cold and from predators, they build nests that are often burrowed into the bank with an underwater entrance. Muskrats feed mostly on cattail and other aquatic vegetation, but also eat small animals. The great egret is a large heron with all white plumage. Standing up to 3.3 feet tall, it is often called the white heron, a cousin of our friend Bernie, the blue heron. The great egret feeds in shallow water or drier habitats, feeding mainly on fish, frogs, small mammals, and occasionally small reptiles and insects, spearing them with its long sharp bill most of the time, by standing still and allowing the prey to come within the striking distance of its bill, which it uses as a spear. It often waits motionless for prey, or slowly stalks its victim. Here is our old friend Bernie at the same beaver dam. There are lots of frogs and small fish in the water so he and the egret like to dine there. You all remember Otto the Otter from last winter, right? Well here is a surprise. Otto has relatives, lots of relatives. Here are five. An otter's den is called a holt or couch. Male otters are called dogs or boars, females are called bitches or sows, and their offspring are called pups. Even more surprising, here are seven otters. The gestation period in otters is about 60 to 86 days. The pup lives with its family for approximately one year. Otters live up to 16 years, they are by nature playful, and frolic in the water with their pups. Its usual source of food is fish, but it may sample frogs and birds. The otters, muskrats, beavers, and a plethora of other aquatic wildlife all live in the environment created by the beavers. Speaking of beavers, let's see what they have been up to. They have been very busy this spring with four dams along one stream on the farm. This is Mama Beaver's husband. His name is Papa Beaver. He is Bucky Beaver's dad and a fine specimen of beaverhood. We will show you how we know he is Papa Beaver rather than Mama. Watch closely as the beaver family cross the dam. Look at Mama Beaver's tail and you will see someone has taken a big chunk out of it and Bucky stays close to Mom as always. See how closely Bucky stays to his mom. By the way, baby beavers are called kids. Now we are not going to point any fingers, but do you think Sammy the Snapping Turtle had anything to do with it? We used to think that Mama Beaver was a wonder beaver, building all these dams by herself as Bucky watches on. until we saw this video of Papa Beaver working with her.
Who knew beavers worked as a team? Beaver teamwork. What amazing animals. Let's get back to our wild life. We have some old friends visiting us and some new and unexpected ones. This is Eloise, we have not seen her for a long time. We can tell it is her by the notch in her left ear if you look closely. It is hard to tell if she is pregnant this year. Eloise is a strange deer. She usually does not hang out with the other does, but is often a loner. A wonderful morning stretch. This is extremely interesting, Matilda is still with her boys. And showing them affection. We are not dear obstetricians, however, Matilda does look a little pregnant to us. Here she is with the boys again and their horns are growing as we go into summer. One thing for certain, this doe is pregnant. Our favorite buck, Romeo, was seen at night. His horns are growing nicely, but unfortunately, he still limps. We usually put grease on the feeder legs, but Rain washed it off and Curly was able to climb up. You will notice that he generously gives some to his brothers on the ground as well as feeding himself. It is early June and the hay was just mowed. Matilda and the boys survey the new landscape. A few weeks later we find Willoughby and Poppy near the feeder. Their horns have grown. Willoughby gives Poppy a good thump on the back. Boys will be boys. We have observed over the past year that there is a deer hierarchy. The older bucks tend to stay together as do the younger ones. The big boys here are strolling through the south part of the farm. Our favorite buck shows up in early July. Romeo is looking magnificent in velvet horns. He still limps and probably will forever. This is Alfonso at night. He will probably have his largest horns again this year. A little dose of cuteness as a fawn cautiously crosses a beaver dam. This is Hooter the Owl. Hooter looks to see why the hawks are making such a racket. Hooter is hunting for breakfast. Now that our kittens are grown, we have noticed that they do not travel in pairs as much as when they were young. Watch as this beautiful cat spends some leisurely time on the log bridge.
We see one of our cats walking along with deer about 75 yards behind. Everybody is at peace for now. However, in this video we see two does getting aggressive with a bobcat, more than likely one of our kittens. Nobody was hurt in this skirmish. Let's spend some time observing our newborn fawns, and their doting moms. and probable demise of our beloved tripod, the three-legged raccoon. We have 45 cameras about the farm, and for the past several months we have not seen tripod. Nobody knows how tripod lost his leg or if he had a disease. He might have been born without it. However, his handicap probably made him a prime target for the coyotes. Go quietly into the night, beloved tripod. We will all meet at Rainbow Bridge someday. This is the pregnant female coyote. The Atlanta Coyote Project states, the pregnant female will eventually settle into a den and after a two-month gestation period, multiple pups, usually between four and seven will be born in the spring. Both parents help to raise the offspring by providing food, and pups are weaned and begin to venture out of the den after about 35 days. 
Pups remain with their parents over the next few months, but they grow up fast and must eventually strike out on their own before the next generation is born. Some of the offspring might remain to help raise the next batch of younger siblings, but most will disperse in an attempt to find their own territory and mates. The parents can then start to produce a new litter of pups when mating season comes around again. A Georgia Department of Natural Resources paper states that increased numbers of coyote sightings create increased concerns of landowners for their property and safety. However, by nature, coyotes tend to steer clear of potential danger. The article also states that, contrary to popular belief, these animals do not hunt in packs but rather are primarily solitary hunters. Well, take a look at this footage. A well-planned hunting trap was set for one of our deer. The male coyotes divided up at the top of our pond. One came straight down after the doe while the other came in from the left. Coordinated hunting. Luckily for our doe, she escaped into the thicket. And here they are spreading out again for another hunt. You know things are bad when the coyote pack scares even the toughest of our raccoons. Curly books it out of there in a hurry. That looks like a deer leg to us. little Bobo the Poodle, or Felix the Cat would stand a chance against these apex predators? It is late August at Hog Wallow Farm. Hot, muggy days in the 90s and unfortunately a very wet month. This makes haying very difficult. All the parents are busy raising their families. Mama Beaver and her husband have had twins. We can tell it is our mama by the notch in her tail, if you look closely. The babies stick close to mom. Their names are Buford and Bartholomew. Mama Hen is walking her children with the help of Aunt Tu Lulla on a sunny afternoon. She has luckily kept them safe from the coyotes, not an easy task. A mature male turkey is called a tom or gobbler. A mature female is called a hen. A yearling male is a jake. A yearling female is a jenny and a baby is called a poult. It is early morning in late August and Mama Raccoon is searching for breakfast with her babies. 
As you can tell they are a noisy bunch. Mother raccoons can have between two to five babies in a litter, and they will have just one litter per year. Baby raccoons are called kits, and they are typically born in early spring between March and April. But if a mother's first litter does not survive she may give birth to a second litter as late as June. All families seem to have that one child and raccoons are no exception. Unfortunately the coyote pups have grown and are now hunting on their own. Deer fawns are growing rapidly and are losing their spots. And most unusual of all is Matilda and her two sons, Poppy and Willoughby. They are still together. This is extremely unusual and baffling to our local deer experts. For a little while we thought Matilda was pregnant, and quite possibly had another fawn. A lot of does come up to the feeder to eat corn, and bring their babies. More than occasionally we would see Matilda, Poppy, and Willoughby with a fawn mixed in. In this video we see Poppy chasing a fawn. Whether it belongs to another doe, or Poppy is harassing a sibling, we do not yet know. We have been observing and videoing our neighbor wildlife for over a year and a half. What a wonderful learning experience. Here is Eloise as she jumps over a fence to get a corn breakfast. A strange but wonderful doe. She looks well today. We were there when Willoughby and Poppy were born. They are Matilda's two sons. We have watched them grow into fine young bucks that, surprisingly have stayed with their mother. She always dotes on them and affection is truly apparent. Poppy is the scrappy one who fought off the corn-stealing raccoons, and became a legend amongst the local herds. And who can forget the tragic fight between Romeo, our favorite buck, and Rufus. Romeo still limps today. But is a magnificent-looking buck. Then there is Bernie, 
the political look-alike who almost got eaten by our bobcats. Bernie is alive and well. Speaking of bobcats, the kittens are grown up and doing well, but still getting into trouble. Of course the coyotes are still here. And Mama Beaver had twins in the spring. She has four dams and is still married. Her son Bucky graduated engineering school and now builds his own dams. Old Fred the rescue donkey is doing well. He has adjusted to the goat herd and rumor has it that he may be getting a girlfriend soon. Good luck Fred! It is late September as we say goodbye to our animal friends and families for now. We have had many requests, well maybe two, to keep making videos of our wildlife. We will probably do so from time to time. Thank you for watching.